Uh, we welcome a few of our guests uh, from Israel, uh, some of them nutritionists and some of them very experienced people. And uh, they came to, uh, to listen to your lecture and to see if we can take something from uh, your knowledge and to improve our dairy industry in Israel. So it's both sides. So welcome and the ground is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Phil Cates, and I'm from Michigan State University Extension. And we live, my wife, who is in the back row, and going to give me the critique after I'm done to see if I do OK. I don't know if your wives are the same, but mine usually gives me the thumbs up or the thumbs down. But we live in Michigan. Water is never a problem. In fact, we have more than enough, many days. But this year, uh, We've had quite the season. It's probably the worst growing season that we've had in my entire ag career, which is 35 years. So it's been a very difficult year. But today, I'm going to talk about forages. Let me pull my presentation up. And by the way, I, I do have to silence my phone. If you need to silence your phone, go ahead and do that now. We don't want to be interrupted too many times. But I work as a forage educator, primarily with corn silage and, and alfalfa. And so those are the two crops that I'm going to concentrate on today as we go through this program. Michigan State University is for all. We welcome anyone to our programs and that's one of the key things that Michigan State talks about and we really hold to that and want everyone to be involved as much as possible. So what do I mean when I say I want to improve forages? There's a lot of meaning behind that, but I'm gonna say that no matter what farm I go to, every single farm can improve. Some people are very good at what they do already, and I learn from them when I go on their farms. Some people are average, and some below average, but I'm here to say that every phase, every segment of that industry can improve. And one of the things I want to encourage you to do is think about improving one or 2% every year. That's not that hard. And it's one of the things that I want to encourage you to do because cumulatively, over time, 1% becomes 10% in 10 years, 2% becomes 20% in 10 years and that starts to make a big difference. And we want to make higher profitability. That's really the bottom line when it comes to farming today. Agriculture has been through many difficult times. This has been a very tough time for all of us in the dairy industry. So we want to make sure that we can have the best profitability possible. When I talk about forages, corn silage, and alfalfa, I'm going to talk about three primary areas. We're going to grow the crop, harvest the crop, and store the crop. So let me start a little bit, and this is my own assessment of what's happening for forages across the United States. We're seeing a decrease of alfalfa and an increase in corn silage, and it's not a little bit, it's dramatic. And some of the farms in this room, I want to ask how many are feeding more than 50% corn silage? Glenn's the only one. On your forages? Pete's here too. Where's Pete? Pete is not here. I'll guarantee he's feeding more than he is too. Yeah. And Cal, how about you? No. Cal, where are you from? California. California. They don't have corn silage out there like we do. Okay? But in Michigan, where we have a lot of dairies and, and there's a lot of wet weather to grow a, a great crop of alfalfa and corn silage. When was the last time you were under 50%? Corn silage? Yes. Sure. It's been a long time, hasn't it? Uh, 25, years. 25 years? I'm going to say around 1980, I saw a lot more 75% haylage, 25% corn silage than I do today. And I'm going to say that we're probably close to that 25 to 30% haylage today, alfalfa haylage. 75% corn silage. And there's been a dramatic shift in corn silage usage across Michigan. 
But I'm going to start with alfalfa primarily to start with today. And as you look at the trend lines for our cropping systems across the United States, this is taken from the USDA. And you can see that one of the things that has happened with corn grain, it has risen dramatically. We average 1.9 bushel increase per year across the country. That's a huge increase when it comes to corn production. So we have better hybrids producing more corn, more corn silage that is higher in quality. Alfalfa, on the other hand, when you look at alfalfa, it has stayed relatively static for the last 20 years. Very few differences as far as yield is concerned. And that's one of the challenges that we have with the alfalfa industry today is that we're not seeing the increases for alfalfa to improve yield-wise. We've seen increases as far as quality, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But we're not seeing that increase like we are with corn silage, and it's affected the way our rations are put together. So when I talk about growing alfalfa, establishment is really the, the key to this. And this is not rocket science, and some of these are going to be reminders for you. You must start right in order to end right. And you never get over a good start or a poor start when it comes to having a very good alfalfa stand. You must have the right location. Alfalfa wants dry feet. Israel is a great place for dry feet, but you don't have the rain to make it grow after it's dry. So that doesn't work. We want fields that are going to be level, well-drained, with no water pockets. I've seen tremendous amounts of problems with water pockets the last two years. We've had too much rain during the winter time. We have winter kill, causing us to lose our stands prematurely. When we talk about the right variety, I'm going to talk about yield, disease resistant traits, and again, variety selection will vary from farm to farm, from region to region, just like our friend from California. He grows very little corn silage. These alfalfa varieties that you choose today will vary from area to area. Michigan State University does university forage yield trials annually. And one of the things that I tell every producer that I talk to is use improved forage varieties as much as possible. It may be more expensive, but I believe it's going to be the best value for you to buy as a producer. They have increased yield com compared to the old standard, and they also have increased disease resistance, and we'll talk about some of those things. We also want to talk about the traits that are associated with these alfalfa varieties for fall dormancy and winter hardiness. We have lots of snow and frost in Michigan, lots of freezing weather, so we have to worry about dormancy of the alfalfa. I'm going to talk about Roundup Ready alfalfa as one of the key things that has come into, the, into Michigan and across the United States versus a conventional. And then we also have a reduced lignin compared to our conventional varieties. How many are using improved Roundup Ready alfalfa varieties today of the, our producers? None? Seriously, okay, interesting. Well, let me talk a little bit about yield when it comes to alfalfa. One of the things that I see with our university trials is that we have, over the years, always had higher average yields than anything that I see on, on farms, on an average. In Michigan, our average mean for the university trials are 117% of vernal, which is the standard hybrid, the standard variety used. That averages five tons of dry matter per acre. One acre is worth four, what is the term? Dunum. Yes. Dunum. One acre is four dunum. So we have 5.73 dry matter tons per acre. That's the average. The highest is 150%. The lowest is 100%, and that's vernal. According to our ag census, Michigan averages 2.3 dry matter tons, which is less than half of what we get at our university trials. That is the average across the state of Michigan. In the United States, it's three tons of dry matter per acre. Again, less than almost half of what we get in our university trials. So what's the difference? 
It's paying attention to detail and making sure that you do the things that need to be done in order to have a high producing, well established hay field. But looking at these trials, you need to be very cautious when you look at university data, just like any other data that's out there. The reason I say this is because of the 45 varieties that I compared, only eight varieties had three or more trials that they were involved with. Out of those trials, they averaged 114% of vernal. So even though there, I had a seed company at a field day say, oh, we have the highest yielding alfalfa variety at the Michigan State University trials, 150% of average. They were in one trial, one year, and it was the year that they had the highest average yield across the state of Michigan. So you have to read between the lines and listen to what's being said. Use as much data as you can possibly find to compare the varieties and the information that's being said. Because we all know that it, it's one of those things where if it sounds too good to be true, usually it is. So read between the lines when it comes to these varieties and use the best varieties that you can find with the highest average yield across multiple locations. For alfalfa varieties, if you're in the top 15 to 10% of the trials on a consistent basis, you have a very good high, a very good average and a very good variety that you can work with. You're not gonna win every trial, but you can do, be very consistent and have excellent yields right there. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about fertility on alfalfa and why that's important. This is Liebig's state or law states that growth only occurs at the rate permitted by the most limiting nutrient. And this is true across the world. If you have one nutrient in the soil that's limiting, you will limit the entire yield of the plant. In Michigan, we have farms that produce a lot of income, farms that produce average income, and farms that lose money virtually every year. And sometimes you're not able to put the amount of money into that farm that you might like to. And so I look at this and say, if you have an economic optimum that's here, that's one cost, another cost might be here, but you may only have enough money to be able to apply this much nutrients and fertilizer to the crop, you're still gonna see a benefit, but it's the most bang for your dollar. The most bang for your buck is the way I say it. So even though you may not be able to put on all the fertilizer that you need, putting some on is better than none at all. Remember that, some is better than none. And use it where you can put the most good Use it where you can get the most good out of your fields. Michigan State University has a, a recommendation scheme built on three different zones. One is the response zone, which is a build-up range. This would be below the critical level needed for the plant and the, the crop to produce. There's an adequate zone and a dry down range. Soil testing is very important for us in the United States and it should be here too. If you are in this range, you will see an excellent response to the fertilizer applied. If you're in this range, you'll see no response to fertilizer applied, which makes sense. If you're in this range, if you have gone through hard times with dairy, you can afford to use the nutrients that are in the field and still get the best yield without adding any fertilizer. But you don't know that until you have a soil test and until you have that soil test done on a regular basis, we recommend every three to four years, you're not gonna really know what you should be doing. So we wanna stay above the critical level, which is 95% of what that crop uses annually. This is what our alfalfa fields look like in Michigan. This would be second cutting and this is, this is a field where we averaged eight tons of dry matter on an annual basis for the average of 10 different varieties. 
Obviously, that was very, very thick, lush alfalfa. We had adequate rainfall. We had adequate nutrition for the soil. And we had fantastic yields. And it was high-quality alfalfa forage that was harvested. Think of, Phil, yes. Is that a second year stand? It was. Yeah. It was. Straight alfalfa. Straight alfalfa. One of the things that I, when I talk about getting, being able to have alfalfa that looks like this, think about what's removed for every ton of dry matter. For every ton of dry matter, and it really doesn't matter whether it's alfalfa or grass, you're going to remove 50 to 60 pounds of potassium per ton of dry matter. That's a lot of material. How are you gonna put it back? Or, or, or are you going to deplete the field of necessary phos phosphorus and potassium, especially potassium. What is potassium gonna do for you as an alfalfa producer? Provide winter hardiness. And one of, the see one of the things that I'm seeing across Michigan and the upper Midwest is that our winter hardiness is reduced primarily because I'm seeing much reduction in potassium across the region. So farmers are not putting enough potassium on even though they may be putting manure back on the fields, manure does not replace the potassium taken off from the crop. When it's taken off, it's about a three to one, 50 to 60 pounds versus 13 to 15 pounds of phosphorus. When you put manure back, it's about one to one. So you don't get the same ratio going back from manure that's taken off from the crop. And so it's one of those things where in order to ensure that you can have excellent winter hardiness, well, all right. In order to have excellent winter hardiness, those potassium levels have to be maintained. They really do. Phosphorus, you have just the opposite reaction to phosphorus. Phosphorus is one of those things that we monitor to make sure we don't have too high levels in our fields. Pete, what's it like in the east? Same thing? Yeah, we tend to have a lot of phosphorus and quite a bit of potassium too. Quite a bit of potassium. The field's close to our farm because we're daily spread for so long. But if you're actually taking three to one from the potassium, are you really putting back enough to be at the critical level, that 95% range is the question I'm asking. No, we're probably deficient. Probably deficient, okay. One of the things that I also see in there is sulfur is one of the the nutrients that used to be deposited across the United States because of sulfur gas, sulfur emissions coming out of our power plants, those have been reduced and so we're seeing a reduction in sulfur across the region. Any, any questions on nutrients when it comes to alfalfa? Okay. Phil, I think you moved by sulfur really fast. I did. Where are you going to find sulfur being a limited nutrient in alfalfa fields? Sandy soils that leach readily. You're going to have areas that have uh, old established stands where you, maybe you haven't put on the fertilizer that you need. Where are you going to have sulfur coming from is another side of it. If you have a lot of manure going back on fields, that is a carrier of sulfur. If you have high organic matter, it is a carrier of sulfur. If you have high clay soils, you usually do not have a sulfur deficiency. So it's on the soils that are gonna be the loamy sandy soils where you have water going through the soil quickly, it will leach and take the sulfur with it. So. This was on a rented field. It's never had manure on, lighter soil. Totally different than what we're traditionally. Sure. And it caught us off guard, but it had tremendous response. 
you can see at least one to two tons of dry matter increase by adding sulfur to that field. If it's limiting, that's how much of an effect it makes. It's dramatic. And sulfur is one of those things where you can get it a lot of different forms. A sulfate is readily available, so things like gypsum, ammonium sulfate, all will provide adequate sulfur to the field, and you should put on approximately 20 to 25 pounds of actual sulfur per year onto the field to maintain and get to the levels that you need to get to. How do you know if you're sulfur deficient? Soil test doesn't cut it. I told you to do a soil test. Don't soil test. You must tissue test in order to know whether or not you have a sulfur deficiency. And it needs to be the top six inches of the alfalfa, and you send it in, and they'll tell you what's, what the actual levels are. So it's one of those things where I add it in here because it, alfalfa is a heavy user of sulfur, and it's a very important part of it because sulfur is one of the main components of amino acids, and protein levels will be affected if you have a lack of sulfur. Small grain reacts differently than the legumes do. And so you have to look at how do they utilize the nutrients that are out there and use those to maintain high yields. You're going to find that sulfur is important for all crops, all the grass crops, whether it's corn or wheat or a, any of the uh, rye grasses, are all going to need sulfur. But I I think that you should put it on probably as ammonium sulfate and make sure that you're at that 20 to 25 pounds and that will maintain what you're looking for as far as yields are concerned. I, I've had farms in, the, in where I live and I'm going to use the map of Michigan now. All right, This is where I live in the thumb region and at the tip of the thumb we irrigate perennial ryegrass and it is a very nutritious, the best quality grass that you can really grow and they were getting between 11 and 12 tons of dry matter irrigated from that farm. So, but they weren't really adding a lot of sulfur to, the, to their soils primarily because they use manure in their water and it's heavy clay or fairly good clay soils with high organic matters. So, those are the places where you can pull that sulfur out of, out of the soil. When I talk about managing diseases and pests, I talk about integrated pest management. Who knows what integrated pest management means to a farmer? Well, that's the right answer, absolutely nothing. <laughs> Nobody cares, okay? <laughs> Even though we should be looking at the crop and determining what's happening from diseases and insects, very few farms really follow through and do what needs to be done. You must scout your fields in order to do what needs to be done. Fungicide, as an example for disease control, many of these alfalfa varieties today have got very high levels of disease resistance bred into them. That's one of the reasons why we say buy the best varieties available with the highest disease resistance, it doesn't cost any extra. If you have problems with other fungal diseases, you can use a fungicide, and our research points to the fact that first cutting is the one where you should put your money towards alfalfa in order to keep those diseases at a minimum. You're still gonna have them, but it's one of those things where I would say it's a limited return on investment. For insects, alfalfa weevil, potato leafhopper, aphids, not normally an important pest for the Midwest, but I'm sure for other parts of the, the nation, like California, it's a huge problem. So scout, if you have a problem, spray. I have farmers that just automatically spray, and I think that's the worst thing to do because it adds cost to the crop without any benefit whatsoever. 
Here are the differences between what we have for the potato leaf hopper variety here, which is all of these little hairs will prevent that potato leaf hopper from actually injecting the toxin into the plant versus the old varieties. It doesn't cost a thing. It's available. I'm going to skip that. So let's talk a little bit more about the alfalfa quality. And I'm going to talk about the variety technology versus meeting the needs of livestock and then cutting schedules and management. Now, maybe you didn't see the protests across the world, but alfalfa growers were saying, save the leaves, save the leaves. You didn't see this on the news? <laughs> you must have missed it. Save the leaves. They were walking the streets across the country, OK? Saving the leaves is where the protein and quality of the alfalfa really is. Here's an example of a farm that is getting ready to uh, chop this alfalfa. They are merging rows and saving the leaves is so critical that you need to make sure to do everything you can to prevent leaf loss. And in our next presentation, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But maintaining leaves is a critical part of alfalfa. Maybe is this, I think this was in Europe where we had this. Leaves have rights too, you know, we want to save those leaves, keep them safe. We don't want to see them go away. You know, resist leaf loss. Green leaves now. Yeah, that's right. It's a, it's a movement that's coming. Okay. So let me, let me say that every farmer, at least in Michigan, maybe not so much here in the Middle East, runs into problem with not being able to harvest forages at the right time. Do you have problems with that? Not oh, why? You don't have any rain. Yeah, but that's the problem, because we start with the late rains <laughs> during the winter, where everybody wants to harvest the wheat for silage. Oh, you do have problems with They're rain. A lot. Yeah. And they want the fields for uh, corn silage. So they plant early, and they want to harvest early, but then gathers whatever they want when they bring the rain in April. No kidding. And you can go on the field, yeah. That makes a plan. Every farm has this problem. Nobody is immune to weather. And because of that, always remember that you have areas where you can put your forages to use for the, for the best benefit. Dr. Dan Understander out of the University of Wisconsin has done a very good job of showing relative forage quality at the bottom with your high producing dairy cows getting the very best forage as possible. And that's true for alfalfa. That's where you need the best. But you also have, I'm going to say average alfalfa, and then you have below average alfalfa. So you always have a place where you can put that crop. And where is the value going to be used in order to make sure that you can use all the crop that you have. And Ben, you said it, I, I, I heard you say it at your farm just before we left. I saved the best crop for my cows so that they can get the most milk. And that's exactly what you should do. Because if you have the best, well, we don't want idle horses, okay? We do have idle horses, lots of them, okay? But if you have, if, if you have, a dry cow or growing heifers that are in their last six months of growth, there's no way that you're going to feed the very best feed to those when it should go here. You have to manage your forage supply and manage it correctly. Now, I, I, I'm skipping around a little bit because I wanted to make sure and hit a lot of different points. So I'm going to talk a little bit about once your crop is established, what do you do? Weeds are a huge problem in the United States. We have awful weed problems. And today we have resistant weed problems to herbicides across the country. And so controlling those weeds in the first 60 days after establishment is critical to keep that alfalfa stand strong. Otherwise, we have fewer plants. We have less yield, less time in the field. This is a, a conventional wisdom when it comes to traditional forage quality of alfalfa. 
we recommend cutting alfalfa or haylage in the bud stage. Anybody ever seen that before? Of course. If you're from Michigan, you've seen this before. If you're cutting grass, this is in the, in the boot stage, prior to heading out, okay? Before it goes in the reproductive stage, this is where you get the best quality because what happens when protein goes down, lignin increases, yield goes up. So as yield increases, you get more forage to feed, but quality goes down. That's why weather has such a dramatic impact on what happens in that field. And it's, all the crops will have this happen. It's not unique to alfalfa, it's true for grass, or wheat, whatever you're using. So let me ask you a question. We have these traded alfalfas. We have Roundup Ready seed that is now available. And some of the wisdom that is being generated today says there's, you can possibly re reduce your seeding rate. Less seeds per acre initially and still get the same response. I'm not seeing that happen just yet. I need to be convinced of that. There's more work to be done because every Roundup Ready bag has a $125 per bag technology fee. And then when you talk about reduce, the reduced lignin Harv Extras, it's an additional $125 because har, all Harv Extra is also Roundup Ready alfalfa. So that's $250 without the seed. Now I add the price of the seed, and the seed is costing $600 per bag. Per bag. Yeah, it's expensive. How many acres do a bag on a cow guy? 2.4. So that's expensive seed. Wow. Yeah. USDA says it must be cut by 50% flour. If you have a year like we had this year, we didn't cut our alfalfa until July 1st. Our normal cutting date is June 1st or May 25th. So five to six weeks late. And we had fields in full flower. And for the seed producers in California, that's the reason that's there is because you have cross-pollination with other plants and the Roundup Ready gene spreads across the countryside. Every farmer signs an agreement that says you will cut it at 50% or less. Did you know that? Oops, oh, sorry. Uh, didn't really realize that, okay. So it's a, it's a challenge. It's a challenge that many have not even thought about. I went to one of our local seed people and he read the agreement, he says, well, I didn't know that was there. He is a seed seller, <coughs> okay. He is a seed seller. On the yields, what are we seeing with Roundup Ready? Roundup Ready, historically, it's been out since 2012 or 13, has been 5% less in yield compared to conventional varieties grown side by side. I think that's going to be better as time goes on because they have put more into the breeding and the varieties are getting better as time goes on. When it comes to quality, they are seeing a 5% increase as far as digestibility on the crop for that new technology. And it is, a, it is actually a gene that's in that alfalfa. It is a, uh, using CRISPR, which is by the technology, to insert a gene in order to get that quality. We also have what I call conventional. High chest is conventional breeding, but a low lignin variety of alfalfa. Now we have hybrid alfalfas, now in their fourth generation. We also have reduced lodging alfalfas. These have traditionally been the highest yielding alfalfa varieties available. Quality wise, this one, this high chest, which is reduced lignin, our recent trials show that high chest and Harv Extra are similar in quality. It's not published material yet. We have to verify it. We've seen two years of data, and what we surmise 
is that the Harv extra, as the varieties continue to increase, that the gene is not holding up, and that the, that the 5% increase as far as digestibility is decreasing to be closer to this 3% that the digest is. So that's new research that's not even been published. I couldn't even put it in my slides, but I'm gonna say that we're, we're gonna look at that very closely. These are $250 less per bag than, than this one. That's a lot of money. So when you say 3 and 5% more digestible compared to right. more digestible? I'm going to say uh, digestible fiber. Okay, Less lignin, it's undigestible, so you're going to have more components that are going to be available to the cow. I don't have, the, I don't have all of it, that in here. Um, but it is one of the things that it has shown up to have higher milk production and higher digestibility, especially on the forage and fiber side, on the fiber side. Does that make sense? Owen, does that make sense to you? You're a nutritionist. It does, but your reduction, I think that's what we see and that's part of where I think one of the bigger benefits to low lignin high gest harvest window may be a little more forgiving. You mean grow it up to 35 days? Okay, right. And that's what the seed salesmen are, are telling us. The alfalfa company representatives for Harv Extra allow the crop to grow longer and get more yield with no loss in, in quality. Oops, that should be quality, okay. No loss in quality or in an increase in yield, that's wrong but I'm not convinced because in Michigan, we have a very short summer. And I don't know if, if you're gonna cut your crop the 20th September in order to get that, that third cutting at 35 days. Um, now I think you're in a, in a range where you may hurt your winter hardiness and the ability for that alfalfa to make it through the winter as well. There's a lot of research that's been done the last three years on these new varieties and this new technology. I'm waiting to be convinced, let's put it that way. I hope it works because to reduce the cutting and still get the, the same yield would be a boost for the farmers. It really would with the, the same quality. You don't look convinced, Owen. It's, uh... It sounds good, doesn't it? Right. Anyway, so really the, the goal of all of this is to try and help you reduce your bottlenecks. Now these are not for drinking, okay? Your bottlenecks are not for drinking here today, okay? So where, where are your bottlenecks? Who, who has problems? Uh, I, I don't know where they are, but really when you are out there looking at, oops, went too far, when you're looking at where you need to reduce your bottlenecks, this is what I want you to think about. Where can I get the low hanging fruit and reduce in order to gain yield, increase forage quality, or is it something else? Those are the questions you need to ask yourself when you're doing this kind of a, approach. Because we want you to see alfalfa that's really high quality. Maybe when you look at your alfalfa cutting schedule, maybe you can reduce the amount of alfalfa that goes in, the, in some of these other cuttings, but your first cutting is so important because you normally have between 30 and 50% of your overall yield is in that first cutting. So you must pay attention to cutting on time. What happened with that slide where we saw the quality go down quickly? First cutting usually is the one where we see this happen the fastest. Cut two and three and four, and I've got a slide right here to show that. This is cut four, usually the highest quality, almost like candy for cows. Cut number one actually it starts down here and goes up here. It can have very high quality. We normally see high milk production from first cutting alfalfa. That's our high yields, high quality, high milk production. Cut two and three, usually relatively similar, 
But I'm going to say that it, looking at the cutting height, if you want to think about cutting a little bit higher, and Glenn, we had this discussion on the way here, uh, you could increase quality because you're getting less stem and saving more leaves. I think I'm going to go on. Uh, now, one of the things that, that I want to encourage everyone to think about, alfalfa is a legume. Legumes produce their own nitrogen and leave it in the soil. Clover is a legume and leaves that nitrogen in the soil. We have found that a good alfalfa stand, if you have greater than eight inches of growth, regrowth after the last cutting, can have 190 pounds of actual nitrogen available for the coming crop. A corn crop will rarely need more than 190 pounds of actual nitrogen. So you don't need any extra nitrogen, and nitrogen is our highest nutrient cost for, for corn. And even with a poor stand, you still have very high nitrogen availability if you cut it and have the growth. Now I'm gonna talk about corn silage the same way that we did the last, high fertility, using the right fertility, the right hybrid, getting a right start and the right harvest. What's wrong with that corn? Who has a... Uh, wasn't irrigated. No, no, well, there was no irrigation yeah, on that it field. Was irrigation. It looks like one of the lines. Between the tower lines, too far. No? Anybody else? <laughs> that's right. Maybe... Like Planting depth? The soil is not... Uh, soil is very uniform. Planting depth. No? It's a different type of corn. You're right. It's a different type of corn. But it also had no nitrogen. Zero. Zero nitrogen. This is actually a nitrogen trial that I did on corn silage for a couple of years. And it shows the benefit of having full nitrogen versus limited nitrogen on a corn crop. Optimum nitrogen rates for corn are not related to grain or silage yield. Let me repeat that. Optimum nitrogen rates are not related, not closely related to the grain or silage yield. Most farmers today use a static amount of nitrogen. We're seeing some farms go to what I'm gonna call a variable rate nitrogen. I'm not so sure that that's right either. But the variability factors that are out there with weather, soil texture, temperature, soil physical properties, soil depth, all of those have more of an impact on nitrogen use in corn than, any, than you would believe. And in fact, for Michigan, Dr. Kurt Steinke, who is our soil fertility expert, for the highest yielding corn, 180 to 220 pounds of actual nitrogen, that would be the range of the highest yielding corn that you could use. And I'm looking at probably 250 bushel plus. Medium would be, well, 165 or below, but it just shows that we would have adequate nitrogen coming out of that alfalfa crop. Now let me little, talk a little bit about hybrid selection. Hybrid selection is one of the most important decisions that influence both dry matter, yield, and quality. Silage hybrids are recommended to be planted at, high, at higher rates, right? Depends, right? Well, maybe. So how high should they be planted? Who's, who, who, has, who has a guess? Phil, any idea? Why? Why there? We actually finished some corn silage work just a year ago, and we looked at four different types of corn silage hybrids. A dual purpose, which is both corn and silage, brown midrib, leafy, and high digestible fiber corn silage. Okay, four different types of hybrids. And when it came to dry matter yield, 
And these seating rates, these are per hectare, 69 to 113, really is 28,000, 34,000, 40,000, 46,000 plants per acre seeded. These are the locations. This is the dry matter yield. No significant difference. No significant difference for the seeding rates themselves. So we saw no interaction between seeding rate and dry matter yield. A little surprised. Well, I was surprised to see that. I expected to see more. We did a, like a small trial here and we got around 10% more with double the double seed. This is 28 to 46, it's not double. But this is much higher than what we normally plant in the U.S. Much higher. What population did you plant? Uh, well, the, the type of seed you're asking? How many? How many? How How many? many uh, the twin rows, the, the 18, 18 per meter. It's 18 uh, per meter? twin rows. How wide are the rows? Because it all depends. Well, now I have to check yeah. All right, so, so. One meter, <laughs> one, meter I think. one to three, I think. You guys are going to have to do the math for me because I don't yeah, know we're meters. We're okay. Did you say no between rows and no between Probably eight inches apart, Phil. Like this. I'll ask the, the, my uh, associate and I'll. Uh, Good man. Good man. I'll come back with the All right. answer. So the cost between here and here is dramatic. We have seen corn prices increase threefold in the last 10 years. $250 per bag, 80,000 kernels. That's a dramatic increase in the price of corn. So this is new, new research and the hybrid seeding rate, hybrid by seeding rate, we just didn't see the difference. Okay, how about milk yield? More milk, right? But for the different types of hybrids, okay? No hybrid times seeding rate interaction for milk yield. So even though we had higher, higher seeding rates, the milk yields were virtually identical. There was a difference when it came to the BMR, okay? It was less yielding than the others. BMR is less yielding. So that's 72,000 seeds per acre. That's high. So is that seeds per acre? How many of those emerge? I guess that's the other question. That's, that's really it's interesting because we push the population down from, from what the grain agronomists are saying to save money. And yeah, let me, let me make a comment about corn hybrids. What's the difference between the corn hybrids grown today and the corn hybrids grown in 1960. Or specialized. Specialized in what way? Green art hybrids. And corn was corn in 1960, and F1, F2. Now you've got S single cross corn. hybrid Brown, corn. Flax ear. Okay. All these things. You have traits for insect for disease and insect resistance, but. Probably the highest and the, and the biggest difference that I see today is the ability to withstand stress at high populations. We used to plant at 18,000 plants per acre, went to 20, to 24, to 26, to 28, to 32, to whatever. Today, we can withstand those higher stress, stressors for that corn plant and it doesn't fall over. That was the problem years ago. Today it stands and it stands strong and we're able to harvest it. So there's a big difference when it comes to how these hybrids react. But they're not that much different. Corn is corn. You're right, Glenn. Corn is corn. In a way. Right. So we looked at the corn silage quality. No hybrid by seeding rate interaction for corn silage quality. We expect to see differences, but we didn't. And I, I was surprised. I'm gonna go on. When we looked at nitrogen rates, that trial that I talked about, again, when we got above 
When we got to 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre, we saw a dramatic increase in trend on percent protein. Most farms have too much nitrogen from dairy, not enough. They want to be able to put more manure on than the government wants them to. That's what I'm seeing. <clears throat> I, now I'm going to switch gears and talk about something that's in the U.S., but I want to alert you here in, in Israel to a dis new disease that has spread across the Midwest in the last four to five years. It's called tar spot. Tar spot looks like this, okay? Yeah, exactly. It's like you took a paintbrush and went like this with paint on that corn leaf. You can't rub it off, you can't scrape it off, but it has a dramatic effect. We're seeing 60 to 70 bushel decreases per acre with that disease. And it has spread quickly. You can't read it. This is 2015. This is 2016, 17, 18, 19. And look where it's spread in Iowa. Iowa is the corn, we're in the corn belt. It has spread dramatically. It is gonna go east. It's already in Ontario. And it's also in Florida. Okay. It causes havoc on our corn hybrids. Pete, you don't want it. Yeah. Okay. You can keep that out there. I, I, I hope we don't, but yeah, it's coming. Okay. So this is one of those things where it developed, it actually came out of Mexico. And it's one of those diseases that has come and basically jumped across the country up into the Midwest. Weather has an effect on it, but it has a, a huge effect on the, on the corn silage itself. This is corn silage that is severely affected with, with tar spot. Excuse me? Is it, is it an insect or fungi? This fungal. Fungal? Fungal, okay. Severely affected, less affected. It's flat. You couldn't harvest it if you tried. That's a corn silage field. It went from being green to brown in two weeks. Wow. Yeah. The next field over is corn too? No. Soybeans. These are soybeans. Well, okay. So here's what it looks like for less affected. Here's what the affected stalks look like. It cannibalizes the entire plant. It comes in usually at tasseling, but it can come earlier than that. Our plant pathologist had a plant that was that tall that was infected with tar spot from here to here. Yes, and if you irrigate, it's worse. So it really is associated with the amount of moisture on the leaf wetness. And so that's one of the things that we need to really be careful of. If you are faced with these things, you need to really pay attention because these are our normal things that we, we worry about when we're making good corn silage. Harvest at the right moisture levels. I talked to someone earlier today about that. Chop at the right particle length. Use a kernel processor. Kernel processing is critical, and who is responsible for that kernel processing? Chop as fast as possible, fill as fast, pack it, pack it, pack it, and then pack it some more, and when you think you've packed it enough, pack it some more. And then cover it as fast as possible, and exclude air and water. They are the enemy. You want to keep those, the air and moisture out of that corn silage. What part of the length do you suggest now with corn silage? We're around this length. About an inch, two centimeters or something. Two centimeters. A little bit less than an inch. Mm -hmm. Yes. Bill, I toss it back to Zach and all of it. Pack it, pack it, pack it some more. Pack it uniformly. Don't wait till you're done and spend. Well, right. <laughs> it, 
I mean, it's as it's going in, your chopper has to match your bunk. That's yeah. got to be And you're packing the pack there. Yeah. 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 I, I've read that someplace. Yeah. Gotcha. I've read so that someplace. You gotta be scaled to the right intake, not get it, done and make mush on top and think you've got something. Glenn, you, you could have done this presentation. No, I can't. <laughs> when you talk about densities, the measure of densities and how we do that, packing densities. I'm not going to talk about it here. Okay. In fact, we're not going to talk about it because I didn't have time to. But you believe it, right? Testing for density? Yes, I do. Okay. Yes, I do. So with, with tar spot, and it takes two weeks to cannibalize a corn plant that goes from 80% moisture to 20% moisture in two weeks. How are you going to chop that? If you have 500 acres, or a lot of a lot of forage to chop, it makes it virtually impossible. You've got to look at damaged areas and get there first. Okay. When this. It, when it does that. Yes. Um, No, it, it, it kills the plant. So that's why the yields are reduced so much. Um, this is what it looks like when it first starts. You'll get just a little bit, a little spot here, a little spot there. And it's only a few plants in the field to start with. But that field's infected. And next year you'll have more inoculum, more inoculum, more inoculum. In three years, that, that field probably will have plenty. The cold does not kill it off. It spreads by spores. And if your neighbors, ha your neighbors have it, then you have it. And it overwinters in the residue. It's, it's pretty dramatic. It really is. And the seed companies are scrambling right now because they don't have resistance for it. Uh, secondary infections take place and just wipe it out. So if, if, you're, if, if you are cutting at extreme dry matters, okay, if optimum is 35, okay, 32 to 36% dry matter, okay, what happens if it's too late versus what, if, what happens if, it, if it's too early? Low starch, low energy, excess acid, high acetate, acetic acid, seepage, if it's too early, and you, you pick your poison, basically, of what you're going to do. If it's too late, it won't pack. Right, Glenn? We talked about that earlier today. Low starch digestion, low acid production, hard to pack, poor aerobic stability, moldy or hot silage, a feed out. All of those are reduced intake. Are most of the farms in your area no tilling? No. No, I'm going to say that no-till is one of the things that we're doing, but it's not the majority. Minimum reduced tillage is probably the way I would say it. Would plowing residue under slow this stuff down? No. If your neighbor has it, you've got it. I mean, like, everyone wants to bury this stuff before it gets to New York. State well, of New York. <laughs> let's, let's pile Pennsylvania. <laughs> okay. If it's too late, what do you think about adding water by, by hose to pack it better? You can never add enough water. Never add enough water. Because the plant is already dead. And you're taking water that was inside the leaf tissue and trying to replace that with water on top. It, it's not absorbed the same way, and you can't add enough. You want to have a better fermentation and comparing to not adding water? Logistically, we aren't set up to add that yeah. water. Yeah, you'd have to have a. And that's what we have a situation when we did it. You, you need a hose like this. Yeah, that's what we do. That's what sometimes, we do. sometimes. <laughs> but, but again, it it doesn't absorb the moisture. It doesn't absorb the moisture the same way that it gives yeah. it up. The question is, does it help uh, with packing and Limited. fermentation? Limited. Limited. Okay. Do you have any other tip for late uh, dry no. <laughs> no. corn? Here's, here's what happened. These are actual samples from an infected plant.
Dry matter went from 47 to 81. Protein went 82 to 75. 27 to 38. More digestible. Oh, okay. Starch reduced. Sugars reduced. Energy reduced. Nothing good. Not really. And that's in a two week time period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, your question add water? May not be practical. How much water can you really add? And for each load, you need that, that hydrant. Okay? May not be practical. Diluted at feed out. I'm gonna, I think producers would rather do this than this. Only one big exception Clostridium. Oh, plus that. <laughs> leachate. Leachate is a pro yeah, it's absolutely a problem. It really is. But I, we did a trial this year looking at different inoculants to try and work with very wet silages, and it, it, there's no silver bullet. That's what I'm saying. Anyway, that I'm going to stop. There's a lot of things going on. Like I say, this has been a difficult year. I wasn't kidding. Yeah. Uh, just you said something about eucalypts. You tried. You don't have any slides about it because now it's no. It's a big product uh, used in Israel. With, uh, EMZU. EMZU, it's called. It's with uh, the uh, bacteria, also for silage. And they say it makes. They show such a fantastic result with uh, adding it to the silage that farmers all around Israel use it. Uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, what, what does the data say from a comparison with and without taken at the same time, same location, same? Depends who paid for the comparison. Depends on who paid for it? Okay. <laughs> That's why we are in business. Objective test about EMZU, I don't think in Israel has been an objective experiment, correct? There was only in a small sample. Yeah, but, uh, That's why we are here, is to do unbiased, third-party evaluation of materials and information. That's where we shine, because sometimes it's not doing the research, but it's verifying what's already being done at the same time. So, to me, we did compare uh, heterolactic-based inoculants, a lot of people are using albuquinari, okay? But th those aren't, those aren't cure-alls. They're not gonna fix every problem out there, okay? Here, most of the people that use a silage additive use sulfur, sulfur salts, you know, like- Sulfur salts. Like Silo Guard, maybe you have, I think you have it in the States. I saw somebody with a Silo King jacket on today. From the company that gave him the, the mixers, <laughs> Paid for the jacket and got the mixers. All right, but anyway, I, I'm finished. Thank you for your time very much. Thank you. All right. Okay. Hey, everybody, stand up. Yeah, everybody, stand up. It's too hot in here. Woo. How are we doing, Ophir? How how are we doing on time? Okay.